Hello and welcome to today's lesson on communities and ecosystems. You see there are some butterflies here. Butterflies with some really scary, I don't know, the artist obviously didn't pay very much attention to the body, but uh, clearly the wings are pretty. So anyways, uh, we're talking about ecology here. Uh, what is ecology? Well, the quick definition is you're looking at the relationship between organisms and their environment. So the thing about this unit, a lot of the ecology stuff is very intuitive. So even if you don't know and you can't figure out what some of the questions are asking, a lot of ecology stuff is intuitive. We, you know, you're living with these things. You can figure out what happens or you can guess if I kill a bunch of the foxes, uh, how is that going to affect rabbit populations, right? So you can kind of make a prediction. So there's a few terms we have to be familiar with and biotic and abiotic. Biotic sounds like bio, right? Abiotic means not to do with bio. So actually biotic is referring to living things and abiotic is referring to non-living things. And we'll go through a few more examples of what's considered non-living later. So living things, you know, animals, organisms, plants, bacteria, uh, your basic kingdoms, non-living factors would include things like carbon dioxide, oxygen, um, glucose, inorganic compounds. Remember that carbon dioxide, although it contains carbon, is still considered inorganic. Alrighty. Um, some important terms to know so you can just follow along with your handout really quickly. Species, the definition of species, uh, this is the textbook definition, a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. That means you're considered part of the same species if a male and female of the supposed same species can make a baby and their babies can still make their own babies. That makes them a species, like a, a human and a, an orangutan would be considered different species because a, a human and orangutan may try to make babies, but they probably won't be successful and they might be ridiculed as well. But there's no way they're going to produce fertile offspring or any offspring, let alone fer offspring that could make their own babies. Anyways, we start going up uh, this chain of terms here. Uh, habitat, the environment in which a species normally lives. Not too difficult. When you're talking about a population, you're usually talking about a big group of individuals belonging to the same species. So a population of earthworms in a particular area at a particular time. So you're still looking at uh, a single species. But when you go, when you branch out more, so think of our school community, you have all different uh, parts or organisms living together. Uh, working together. So community is when you have a, you're considering a group of populations that are living and interacting with each other in the same area. And then you go all the way out. Well, there's some other bigger terms, but this is as far as we need to go for now. Uh, ecosystem level would be a bunch of these populations uh, interacting in a bunch of different communities and these communities and how they interact with abiotic factors and temperature, oxygen concentration levels, uh, pH levels of soil. So ecosystem is looking at living organisms and their interaction with non-living things as well too. Okay, a couple other terms. Uh, I don't know what this yellow line is here, but uh, let's add more to it. Yes. Autotroph. Auto, meaning kind of self. Troph Mm, the origin of this particular root, I should have looked it up, but it's either Greek or Latin and it has something to do with feeding. So it's kind of, this kind of autotroph kind of looks like self-feeding. Heterotroph, uh, hetero kind of sounding like uh, other, okay? So other feeding. So in other words, you have to decide if you're a self-feeding, uh, we need a better example, self-feeding organism or eating others. And so you get these two examples here. An autotroph. A plant, for example, anything that does photosynthesis is an autotroph. Uh, anything that is heterotroph has to eat other things to obtain their energy. So here's a plant, tree, the autotroph. It synthesizes its own organic molecules from inorganic substances. It's a fancy way to say it produces its own food by way of 
photosynthesis. So all plants, things that contain chlorophyll can do that. I cannot produce my own food. I can't even cook. Even if I go hang out at the beach and soak up the sun rays, it's not like my cells can produce glucose. If they could, I would be green. I would have a lot of chlorophyll. And there would be even more reasons why women want, wouldn't want to talk to me. But anyways, I'm a heterotroph. I have to eat other types of uh, organisms in order to get my food. I can eat plants, eat other animals, but that's basically the difference between autotroph and heterotroph. Some special types of organisms. Well, a couple of these words I have a hard time remembering, but uh, you can do better. A consumer is an organism that ingests other organisms, kind of like a heterotroph. So you're going to see many terms that are representing the same thing, but how they organize is how they how they're organized is what's important. So that's a, a cute tiger that would be considered a consumer. A detritivore is an organism that ingests non-living organic matter. Earthworm would be such an example. And you have to make sure you can distinguish between a detritivore and a saprotroph. A saprotroph is an organism that lives on or in non-living organic matter. And they actually get their energy by digesting things outside of their body. So right here it says secreting digestive enzymes and then absorbing it into the products uh, Absorbing the products of digestion. Chin. Uh oh. No, it's a spelling mistake. Okay. Uh, what do I do? Well, I actually I eat things. I'm a heterotroph. I'm a consumer, and I do all my digesting with enzymes and adequate pH levels inside my body. If I were a saprotroph, this would be really disgusting. I would basically vomit my digestive juices onto my hamburger and wait for my hamburger to be broken down into for, wait for the starch to get broken down into glucose and wait for the the proteins to be broken down into the amino acids all on my plate it might take a while wait for all the lipids to get broken down to glycerol and fatty acids and then i would just inject i would just blow it all that digested stuff liquid mush on my plate and put it into a syringe and inject it straight into my bloodstream. If I were a saprotroph, that's what I would do. And that would be a really, really horrible lifestyle. Uh, luckily, I don't do that. What are some organisms that do do that? Well, it's not so graphic as what I said, but uh, bacteria and fungi are examples of saprotrophs. They secrete enzymes that can do the digesting outside and then they absorb the products, okay? So three words for you, consumer, detritivore, saprotroph. Then we get to the famous uh, energy pyramid. You'll see this in many different forms. Do a Google image search and see a whole bunch of these. So uh, a lot of things are get, gonna get covered in this diagram. And uh, so let's take a look really quick. So we got grass, grasshoppers maybe eat the grass, blue jays may eat the grasshopper, and then foxes may eat blue jays. That's a really awkward picture of a fox, but anyways, I hope it works out. So you can see this is kind of a feeding chain, or we could call it a food chain, but it's gonna, this diagram will demonstrate a lot of things about how energy is transferred between these organisms here. Um, this level down here where the grass is at, we can also call them producers. Look at all these words meaning the same thing. Autotroph also means uh, producer, makes its own food. A producer gets its energy from the sun. So everything on the bottom level is getting its energy from the sun. Things that eat producers are called primary consumers. This little one with a degree sign is how we represent primary. Uh, things that eat primary consumers are considered secondary consumers. And then third level is called tertiary, tertiary consumer, tertiary, tertiary consumer. So in this case, this fox up here is like at the top of this food chain. Other examples, if you're in the water, maybe sharks would be at the top. In the jungle, the mighty jungle would be like a lion at the top of a food chain. Um, these different levels are called trophic, are called trophic levels. So these are all like, these are four different trophic levels we're talking about here, okay? So we could say grasshoppers occupy a particular trophic level. And like I mentioned before, Producers are getting all their energy uh, from 
the sun, initial, so initial source of energy is the sun. We don't really draw a sun into a food chain because it's weird to say that the grass are eating the sun, but we get the idea. You don't have to put it all in there. Um, one important thing that you need to know, and this is actually, it explains the whole shape of one of these diagrams. Uh, only 10% of the available energy, like scientists have estimated that this is approximately correct, 10% uh, of the energy available at each level, 10% of the energy at this level can only go up to here. So grasshoppers can eat as much grass as they want, but all the energy that's stored in the glucose and the starch and everything in here, the uh, protein and amino acids, only 10% of the energy actually reaches the next level. Um, so where does the other, where does the rest of that energy go? That, that's much better than what I did. So 90% of the energy is lost uh, through processes that result in energy being wasted. So from the grass just dying, if, uh, if when it's actually doing respiration and, and processes, remember that plants are also doing some of the respiration, um, so they're going to be using some of the energy that they're producing as well. So that energy generates heat, and that heat can be lost. So any of the grass that's not eaten as well, and so a lot of the energy gets wasted here. It's not very efficient. At the side, always outside of a food chain or a food web, we'll get into it in a second, are the fungi and the bacteria that will pretty much decompose any of these things. So sorry, my arrows are getting messy, but when a fox dies, it's got some things like that and bones don't just stay there. Blue jays as well, grasshoppers die, grass is going to die, and then fungi and bacteria are going to break it all down. I need some water. I can't pause. I need a more expensive software to pause. Oh well. We're going to start a fund to allow me to pause stuff. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> this diagram here uh, shows the energy flow from one trophic level to the next. Oops, something's going to pop up right here in a second. The units of energy you should be familiar with, um, but when you're doing these energy calculations, as long as you understand that it's 10%, it's not difficult at all, and usually the units will be provided for you, but uh, it's here. It's kilojoules per meter squared per year. Hopefully you should understand this notation. Kilojoules per meter squared per year. So we're looking at energy, uh, in a given area over a, a given amount of time. So that's the energy, that's the unit that we use to represent uh, energy that's passing through various trophic levels. So uh, how, how about this? A typical question, let's say, I'm going to make this, it's not too difficult. Let's use a different color here. It's a nice color. Yeah, let's make it up. Let's say they are, there are 1,000 arbitrary units of energy. I mean, the units could be kilojoules per meter squared per year, but it doesn't matter what the unit is. Let's just look at this, this process. If there's 1,000 units of energy available here, the question is, how many units of energy are available at this level? Well, use this simple math here. Only 10% of the energy goes up each level. So if I go from here to here, I drop down to 10% of this, which is now 100. If I go down, we'll go up one more level, then that should mean I'm end, I end up with 10 units of energy because that's 10% of 10%. So go back and check that out if you're not sure. You'll see some practice questions like that as well too. Uh, so take a look at this question. Try it. Pause the video. Let me play you some thinking music. Did you get the answer? Good job. Here's a diagram here. See if you can figure out what eats what. Mm -hmm. Food chains, very simple. Uh, the most important thing for drawing food chains, this is one of the easiest things in the world, but just make sure your uh, arrows are in the correct direction. So you have to show the direction uh, that energy is flowing. So in that last diagram, if you figured it out, uh, energy is flowing in this direction. 
So when krill eat phytoplankton, the energy goes here. When jellyfish eat krill, the energy goes here. When sea turtles eat jellyfish, the energy goes here. You never draw the arrow in the opposite direction. You can lose 100 marks and cry for hours if you do that. So don't make that mistake. Food webs just show more complex relationships between many different organisms at once. Food chain is a chain. There you go. See, chain, chain. Food web is a web. Look at all these complex arrows. Let me, let, me, let me try to highlight all of them in less than 20 seconds. Go. Oh. Whoa. Thank you very much. Another question? Check this out. Play some more music for you. So suspenseful. Pause it. Pause it. Oh, good job. I'm right. Good job. And this idea that energy enters and leaves ecosystems. I could fly back to that slide really quick. Let's go. Right. This slide is showing how energy is moving up here. Oh, yeah. One thing I forgot to mention, which is worth mentioning. Um, if you ask yourself, are there more blades of grass in the world or more foxes in the world, most people will probably say more blades of grass, right? If you ask, are there more squirrels or are there more lions, people would say more squirrels, right? All the endangered animals tend to be at the very top here because the environment can't support that many of them. Look at all this energy was here, but by the time we go up these different levels, there's you know, 10% of 10% of 10% of 10%, you just can't have enough energy to support that many organisms up at the top here. That's why these energy pyramids, you never have five, you know, six, you never, you'll never see 10 levels. Four or five is usually the max uh, that a food chain would be able to support or something like this. Um, so that's really important. But that's showing energy flowing. So energy, as this energy goes up, it, it, it gets lost, right? Uh, it's produced as it's transferred from sunlight energy into grass or into anything that's photosynthesizing, but eventually that energy is going to get dissipated and lost as heat to warm up our surroundings and atmosphere. And we can't get that energy back. A lot of it gets lost into the uh, in outer space. However, we're flying back down. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Here we go. Uh, oops, what's going on here? Okay. Nutrients, however, are recycled, and one of the main nutrients we're going to learn about is the carbon cycle, but if you choose one of the other options, you can learn um, about the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle is really interesting, but it's only in one of the further uh, options, and if you choose the microbes and biotechnology option later, um, but the carbon cycle here, just some quick pictures. This is... Uh, demonstration of the carbon cycle, and there's various other versions of this. The nitrogen cycle, one of the coolest things for me about the nitrogen cycle, which is not required in your syllabus, but the idea that all this nitrogen, you know, this 70, what is it, oops, 79% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen, it's totally inert. We don't do anything with it. It goes, we breathe it in and we breathe it out. I mean, the stuff that's keeping us alive is oxygen, but that's a mere... 16% and carbon dioxide is a tiny, tiny percentage. So all this stuff that takes up space, uh, we can't do anything with it. But some bacteria can. It can actually take that nitrogen from the air and turn it into nitrates that plants use and stuff like that. So we lose. Bacteria over here is winning. Winning when it comes to using nitrogen. This is me. So sad. See? Sad. Okay! Gotta go. Bye-bye!